Welcome, everyone. I'm glad we had a break in, today, in this week's weather so that you could be here. Um, and I'm pleased to see so many here. Um, we actually had a sold out crowd, um, but we know that not everyone can A, find engineering and computer science. <laughs> And uh, B, uh, that some people who registered early are probably having a lot of trouble getting here today, which makes this uh, today's discussion particularly timely given these recent events. Um, my name is Deborah Campbell, and I'm a professor in the Department of Writing. And um, we're really pleased to welcome you to our annual Harvey S. Stevenson uh, Southern Lecturer. Uh, however, first of all, I would like to uh, have uh, Carla Point, who is our Indigenous uh, Resurgence Coordinator in Fine Arts, give the territorial acknowledgement. Uh, Carla. Thank you, Deborah. Klaku, klaku, hayuchka, gela kesla. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. So, on behalf of the event organizers, we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Hussainage peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. So, who are we acknowledging and respecting, and why are we doing it? in the first place. Well, the Songhees and Esquimalt are the rightful owners of this land on which this university stands. They have a very close, close relationship with the Hussainage people who are located on the Saanich Peninsula. And imagine, if you will, there's this house, there's this beautiful house and you have visitors come. This is what the Esquimalt Songhees people did. They welcomed visitors to their beautiful home. The next thing they knew, the visitors had taken over their house. And pretty much they had been moved out of their own home. This is what's happened with many of our peoples. So doing the land acknowledgement is a step towards reconciliation. And doing so, it's also an act of decolonization. So each time we do it, and we give it meaning, and it comes from here, we are doing acts of decolonization. And that's so important for us. For myself personally, I would like to extend my appreciation to the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Hussainage people for allowing me and my family to live and work in their territories for so very long. I am ever so grateful to their ongoing hospitality. So I just thought I'd share with you a little bit more about what a territorial acknowledgement is and why we have to do it. And I just want it to be meaningful. Klako, klako, hayuchka, gela kesla. Chu. Thank you so much, Carla. The Harvey Southern Lectureship is made possible by a gift from one of Canada's leading publishing families. And it's on behalf of their son, who was an alumnus of UVic and a journalist. And it brings leading Canadian journalists to work with our students here in the Department of Writing. So each year we present a talk by one of Canada's top journalists and uh, invite that person to work with our students uh, through the Department of Writing. And uh, this year, we've had the great pleasure also of having the TAI as our media sponsor. And many of you will know uh, today's lecturer from his uh, work on the TAI. And, uh, and we're so honored to have uh, journalist and author Andrew Nikoforik speak to us today. Um, if you followed his work on the TAI, you've read his hard-hitting investigative journalism on any, everything from coal mining to fracking to more recently the pandemic on which he's written two books. 
Um, but he has a long career, uh, more than 30 years of writing books and articles on the use and abuse of Canada's natural resources and wild landscapes, um, chronicling things like disappearing wildlife, um, peak oil, and the destruction of the boreal forests. Uh, his books on climate change and energy, uh, including Empire of the Beetle, Tar Sands, Energy of Slaves, and Slick Water, and his articles for Canada's leading publications have garnered many awards, including a Governor's General's Award in nonfiction, uh, the Rachel Carson Environment Reward, Award, and seven National Magazine Awards. Today, Andrew will be speaking about energy dead ends, green lies, climate change, and chaotic transitions. Uh, given what we've seen this week, uh, really we couldn't be uh, uh, hearing from him at a better time. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Nikiforic. I feel naked now. Um, thank you very much, Deborah, and thank you in particular to the faculty for this invitation uh, to come and, and speak here. Uh, uh, this is the first time I've, I've given a talk in, in more than two years since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, uh, it, this is very special and you've been very gracious. Um, thank you, Carla, for your welcome. Um, I want to say uh, hello to my invisible friends who are <laughs> uh, doing something I don't do, which is Zoom. Um, and, uh, and I want to welcome all, all my visible friends here. So um, uh, let's begin with a story. Uh, Back in 1950, there was a, an Italian physicist, actually the, the father of the atomic bomb, was having a conversation um, with Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. So it was Enrico, Enrico Fermi and Edward Teller. And you know, they're both physicists, and so physicists quite have intense conversations. And in the middle of this conversation, Enrico, uh, uh, being such a wonderful Italian, said, where is everybody? And, um, and of course, being a physicist, he was, he was referring, you know, in, to really galactic uh, uh, an occasion. He said, look, if you, you know, he took out a napkin and he said, look, look how big the galaxy is. There are billions of stars. The, the possibility for life, uh, you know, must be millions of different civilizations out there. Surely other People, other races, other whatever have discovered atomic energy, fossil fuels. And, and yet, they're not here. They have not visited us. We have not seen them. We, what, what, so his question was, um, where is everybody? And, uh, and for a long time, and this was known as the Fermi paradox. And, you know, so what's the answer? Why, there must be other civilizations out there. Why have they not arrived at our doorstep yet? Why have we not encountered them? It took a long time, but Kurt Vonnegut came up with an answer. <laughs> and he said, we have all but destroyed this one salubrious planet as a life support system in fewer than 200 years, mainly by making thermodynamic whoopee with fossil fuels. So he answered the paradox. The reason we haven't been visited by millions of other civilizations that might be out there is that they came to an energy dead end. And, um, and this also explains why so many billionaires want to get off the planet. Right? <laughs> you know, the, all of these guys, I mean, you, you know, they, they all think we need to become a multi-planetary species because they're absolutely convinced that the behavior of other billionaires is going to destroy us. And they are absolutely right. Um, now, I'm going to talk a, 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 about many heretical things today. Um, 
And, and what I'm really bringing here is my experience as a journalist who has largely covered energy uh, and its consumption and its consequences uh, for more than 30 years. And so let me just quickly summarize what the key things I want to get across and that I hope you can start a conversation about. Climate change is a symptom of a much greater crisis, and that's unchecked economic growth of all kinds. Technology, which is a means for putting energy to work, will not save us this go around. It will only foster greater disorder and fragmentation. It is also poisoning our brains and locking us into modes of highly destructive thinking. We are now inmates or servants to the technosphere, to technological society. Technical logical society is a cancerous growth on the living planet. So as we like to put it so, prosa so prosaically, there's society, civilization, the technocracy, and then everything else becomes this god-awful word, the environment. And of course we hear every day about the need for balance between the technosphere and the environment. Because if we don't have the right balance, then we won't have jobs. We also might not have a place to live either. Um, now as inmates of the technosphere, we know more and more about the world while being less and less able to do anything about it. Population plus affluence plus technology are the root of the problem. Too many people burning too much energy to consume stuff on a finite planet. My God, this message has been out there for 40, 50, 60 years. And what has changed is that the energy that made it all possible is no longer easy or cheap to extract. Our elites promise every day that a host of new green technologies, most of them unproven, most of them vastly uneconomic, un un most of them which will never scale up, will solve all of our problems. But these so-called solutions are really examples of spiraling complexity um, that provides no tangible benefit for much of the population. Civilization, a mullock that demands human sacrifices has gotten too big, too complex, too costly, and too hard to manage. Our political class is in a complete state of denial uh, about all of these you know, existential threats. It will not act till things get worse. You can expect more blah, blah, blah. Energy spending determines greenhouse gas emissions. We only want to talk about emissions. We need to talk about energy spending. Therefore, the only concrete way to bring emissions down is to systematically shrink energy spending and contract the global economy by at least 40%. The globe's political class, again, refuses to discuss this course of action, let alone address the issue of population. So we can choose, if we're even allowed the conversation, a managed energy descent, something few civilizations have ever achieved, or we can face collapse. Sooner or later, policymakers have to acknowledge the fact that addressing environmental breakdown will require a direct downscaling of economic production and consumption in the wealthiest countries on this planet. In sum, expect extreme volatility and political unrest in the years ahead, along with atmospheric rivers, heat domes, and burning forests. So you ask, why should I share this blunt and cheery message? Uh, <laughs> without a glass of vodka in hand. 
I think C.S. Lewis put it best. He said, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin with, and in the end, despair. James Baldwin was even more blunt when he was talking about race in the 1960s. He said, people who do not face the truth turn themselves into monsters. All right. So we're told the story is all about emissions, and certainly emissions are becoming an increasing problem. Um, and they have increased dramatically in the last 65 years. I mean, three quarters of all the emissions we're talking about have come from oil that we have burned in the last 65 years. A lot of that CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere now for up to 10,000 years. We have baked in a lot of trouble coming our way. We've known, I mean, the, the science on climate change has been known since the end of the 19th century. The very mathematical equations that we use to calculate greenhouse gas emissions were all established in the 1890s. But we have been so slow to respond and act. Well, we've responded, and as with blah, 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 and the emissions keep on going up. But again, this is a, a very reductionist conversation to only focus on the emissions. So where are these emissions coming from? These emissions are all the product of our consumption, of the way we live, um, of the whole growth model for the economy. But then we have another existential threat. And this one, to me, is just as grave as climate change. And this is the growing dominance of the technosphere of technological society in every facet of our life. It is altering the fabric of human organization. It is altering human communication by how we find one another, what we see, what we don't see. It messes with our attention. It meddles with our trust and attention. It increases our anxiety. It is polarizing us as a people. You know, when, when you hear somebody like Kevin Kelly, um, you know, who, who's one of the Silicon Valley guys, say, we can see more of God in a cell phone than in a tree frog, you know we're really going down the wrong road. <laughs> and that we are truly in the process abandoning our humanity and the wisdom of our elders. Another threat is that our massive energy consumption has resulted in a biological crisis where one species after another faces extinction. In fact, 100 to 1,000 times higher than pre-human background. I mean, we've completely changed. Uh, the makeup of, of the planet in terms of wildlife. Our other crisis is just the rate and scale of energy spending. So 80% of all of the energy we now spend is coming from fossil fuels. We're using 55 times more energy today than we used back in 1855. Nobody wants to ask, well, how much more energy can we spend? And where is it going to take us if we do that? And how has it changed our culture and our society? And then along with this massive orgy of energy spending, well, I mean, here's a good way to, to express it. I mean, Kenneth Boulding, who was a great economist uh, down in the United States in Colorado, he said, look, in 1859, the United States... Uh, the human race discovered a, a huge treasure chest in the basement. This was oil and gas, and it was fantastically cheap, easy to burn, very convenient, um, offered, was portable, um, gave us the ability to, be, to act and behave like gods. And, you know, 
what did we do? Well, I'm, anybody who discovers a treasure trove in their basement lives it up, and we have been spending it uh, like no tomorrow. And a lot of this spending is reflected in economic growth. For most of human history, we never had this phenomenon of exponential economic growth. This is an anomaly in, our, in, our, in, 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 in the last uh, 200 years that is purely a function of spending fossil fuels. Um, and Gordon, uh, Robert Gordon, who's an economist in the, in, uh, in, in the States, puts it this way. There was virtually no economic growth before 1750, suggesting that the rapid progress made over the past 250 years could well be a unique episode in human history rather than a guarantee of endless future advance at the same rate. And he's absolutely right about that. All right, so now we've got this problem of resources and people and, um, and who's going to get what and how much. And then we've got another crisis on, on, on hand, and that is the growing gap between the wealthy and the poor. This is, I mean, we are now at, at revolutionary levels of inequality, economically speaking, everywhere. And the pandemic is a great example because uh, what happened to all these billionaires during the pandemic? They increased their wealth by $5.5 trillion, by 68% in the space of two years. They made more money than they had made in the last 15 years. The gap is growing. And what do we know about civilizations that have these enormous gaps between the elites and the rest of us? They enter periods of political turmoil. It's unnatural. It is not, this is unsustainable. Uh, it is unjust. It is immoral. And there will be a reckoning coming. Yeah. All right. Hello. Could you talk to Justin Trudeau and tell him that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. Um, uh, all right. So we, the story is just not about emissions. All right. Climate change is a symptom of, of, a, of a civilization that got hooked on fossil fuels. And that era is soon coming to an end because the cheap and easy stuff is disappearing. But now we have a, a poverty of two narratives. We've got two conversations going on. Uh, we say, you know, status quo says, well, we can just continue the way we are and it'll, we'll figure this all out. And, you know, we need to get rid of regulations and get rid of taxes and let the rich get richer. And, and then you have the Green New Dealers saying, you know, well, we can't do that. We've got to, we've got, we, you know, we, we, we've, we've got to transition from fossil fuels to, uh, to renewables, to solar and wind and electric cars, and, uh, and, and we'll make tons of jobs doing all of this, uh, and without mentioning the fact that you cannot make an electric car without spending fossil fuels. You cannot make a windmill without spending fossil fuels. You cannot make a solar panel without spending fossil fuels. All of us in this room, every one of us, is wearing clothing that is made from fossil fuels. Um, and uh, so, where is this all going then? So the propaganda from both sides is out there. You know, they're both busily demonizing each other, which doesn't get us any further uh, and, and certainly doesn't advance the conversation in ways that it needs to be advanced. So we have now about, you know, five different what, what I would call green lies or, or promises by the status quo that you are not to worry that everything is fine. We're going to find some technological solutions to this issue because we don't want to have a conversation about economic growth. We don't want to have a conversation about population. And we do not want to have a conversation about the totalitarian nature of technological society. Um, so the first promise is that, okay, I've got a solution. The solution is we will dematerialize. There's a you know, what a great plastic word there. Um, and it kind of works like this. The idea is that, you know, remember all those things 
that we used to have from fax machines and telephones and all these gadgets and all these artifacts and, you know, and, and, and cameras. Well, you know, you don't need any of that stuff anymore because now you've got one little gadget that's going to do it all for you, right? So we're eliminating all that other stuff and we, we put it into this one little uh, box that has dramatically changed um, our world. There's a big problem with that kind of thinking, though. Um, um, again, it's very reductionist thinking. And, and uh, the problem here is known as Jevons paradox. And so this goes right back to really the beginning of the fossil fuel era with the use of coal. And the steam engine was developed to pump out water from coal mines so we could extract more coal. And the problem was every time you got digging away in a coal mine, you'd hit an aquifer, the water would flood it out, and uh, it would be a huge crisis. So the steam engine was developed to, to solve that problem. But of course, the steam engine was a very efficient uh, uh, piece of technology. And very quickly, it was adopted and used by other industries, the transportation industry, the milling industry, um, uh, agricultural industry, soon everyone was, were, was employing one form of the steam engine or another. And this got Stanley Jevons, a 19th century economist, you know, thinking about all this. He said, okay, well, are, are we going to run out of coal? Um, and and what, what's going to happen when, as, as our machines become more efficient, will we, will we actually use less coal? And he answered the question himself, and he said, it is wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption. The very contrary is to the truth. And what he's saying, the more convenient, the more efficient you make an energy service, the more it will be employed in society. So no materials are saved. In fact, more materials and more energy is being consumed. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, that you can go on to steamboats. This, by the way, Jevon paradox, Jevon's paradox applies, also known as the rebound effect, applies to so many different things. Um, population growth itself can be a Jevon's effect. The more efficient we become, the more people we can sustain. The more people we sustain, the more energy we consume. And on it goes. Um, the more efficient airline traffic and airline fuels have become, the more we travel because the cheaper it becomes and the problem of emissions grows. The same thing with lighting. You can, you can almost take any major thing like that and you can find a Jevons effect involved. Um, here's an example of appliances. Um, just set the dial and relax a while, right? And, and, and all of these are extremely convenient, right? So we, we adopt them because they are convenient. And of course, you know, you know and, and this is really highly sexist advertising, um, but you know it made its point. So in the end, we are in a very dangerous place where back at the beginning of this century, uh, when there was 1.6 billion people, um, we consumed one metric ton of materials per person. And now we've got more than nearly 8 billion people and we are consuming three metric tons per person. Clearly, this is not sustainable in any shape or form, whether we are consuming materials um, for green technologies um, or other technologies. We are still consuming materials. All right, then we have another fanciful um, uh, approach, and this is called direct air capture. And I'm not gonna say too much about it, but the whole idea is that you have a bunch of fans you suck the CO2 out of the air into uh, uh, some kind of uh, absorbent. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, well, this is really what it looks like, but, but actually, well, no, this is, so, you know, and, and, and you take the, the carbon out of the absorbent and then you do something with it. You make a fuel that a car can burn. Uh, you can use it for um, uh, oil extraction. You can use it in greenhouses. Um, or you can use it to carbonize pop. Well, you know, when you think about all of the CO2 emissions that we have now on this planet, 
we could carbonize enough pop to probably <laughs> su supply an entire galaxy with, with carbonated water. Um, so th this is not, not a solution that's going to scale up in, in any real way. There was a great story in the New York Times recently about a Swiss company called Climeworks, and they have a project going on in Iceland. And, uh, and this is their injection facility where they're taking the CO2 that they've captured and in injecting it into basalt rock uh, deep in the ground. And you know, it was a very enthusiastic article and, and full of promise. And maybe this is going to be the way that we're going to solve this, this problem. Um, and, but there's a few things that they neglected really to point out. Number one, to capture 4,000 tons of CO2, and that's the emissions from about 2,500 cars. Um, and the, this project is called ORCA, so it, you, you will accept it and think it's a good thing. Um, uses more energy every year than the entire population of Iceland currently consumes. And that's just to capture 4,000 tons. Oh, and by the way, uh, the process requires 25 tons of water for one ton of CO2. All right. On to our next uh, uh, technological promise. Carbon capture, utilization, and storage. It used to be called carbon capture and storage. Well, um, you know, things change a wee bit. It's been around for more than 20 years. Industry said, don't worry. We'll capture our carbon and bury it in the ground. And we'll, we'll find a good cemetery. And then we'll find a government that will watch over that cemetery for the next thousand years so, you know, no zombie leaks occur and the CO2 comes, comes back at us. And also we'll have to monitor to make sure that we don't cause any earthquakes while we're putting that CO2 in the ground. And also we'll have to make sure and monitor that that CO2 is not entering any groundwater aquifers at the same time. Um, all the very easy tasks and things that governments are entirely capable of doing, as we've all learned. Um, so there are more papers written about the promise of carbon capture and storage um, than there will ever be any carbon capture storage plants. Right? And it's become an academic industry. I mean, it's one of the, the, the largest, you know, there, there's only, there, there, you know, not much more than about a dozen projects around the world. Um, Two of them are in Canada, one in Saskatchewan. Um, there's actually two in, in Alberta. And that, I mean, that represents 17% of global production. Um, the government of Alberta wants the federal government to loan it, well, not loan it, give it uh, another $30 billion so it can build more of these plants. All of these plants have been built with public money. That tells you something right away, right? So they're not very economic. Um, and, but this is the goal, is to put these plants all over the country and to deal with industrial streams of waste. Um, so how are they performing? Well, if you go to Australia, there's a carbon capture and storage unit on an LNG facility called the Gorgon plant. And they promised, this is a Chevron facility, they promised 80% capture and, you know, the capture, then you liquefy it and inject it. So far, they've only been able to achieve 68%. Similarly with the Boundary Dam project in Saskatchewan. Um, so there are lots of issues here. Not even, you can't even keep the promises that you're making. Um, but the, the best is, is, this is a Vaclav Schmil, by the way, a very uh, plain spoken uh, 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 fellow from the University of Manitoba. Um, who's really truly one of the few energy ecologists. Uh, he's, he's an engineer, he's, he's also uh, does a lot of economic writing as well. A brilliant mind, he came from Czechoslovakia, so, in, and he grew up in the shadow of the Soviet Union, so this is a man that does not tolerate bullshit very well. And so whenever he hears anyone talking about carbon capture and storage, he says, that's crazy. And he says, you can never scale this up. And he gives an example. To capture just 15% of the global um, CO2 emissions, carbon capture and storage infrastructure would have to be larger than the current global oil infrastructure. Really? And how long would that take to build? It took more than 150 years to build the, the oil infrastructure we have. You know, so by the time this thing is all built, I mean, we'll all be fried or flooded out or one thing or another. 
Hydrogen. Here's another promise. And you read about it every day now, just every day. So, oh, hydrogen is going to save us. Hydrogen is, is, is the, the new wave forward. Really? Okay. So where does hydrogen come from? All right. Um, you have to make it. You have to spend energy to make it. And there's two ways to do it. I mean, you can crack methane and get the hydrogen out that way. So 90% of all hydrogen production is coming from natural gas. Or you can crack water and split hydrogen and oxygen atoms and, 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 and get it that way. Um, using natural gas is cheaper. Using water is very expensive, a very expensive process. Both are high energy activities. Um, but Alberta loves this idea of getting hydrogen from natural gas. What does Alberta have? A lot of natural gas. And, uh, and what can they do with this natural gas if they crack it and create all kinds of emissions? Well, then there'll be another reason to build carbon capture and storage uh, facilities, right? So hydrogen then becomes another excuse to support another technology to spend more energy uh, and not solve any problems. But then, okay, well, what if we do it this way? What if we use renewables? What if we use wind or solar? to create this hydrogen. Won't that surely be, well, you can look at the complexity here, number one, um, and, and here's the problem. When, and in, when, when you're electrolyzing water to, to get the hydrogen, you lose 30% of the energy while you're splitting the hydrogen and the oxygen, and then you lose another 26% um, in transporting it. So you've lost 48% of your energy before you even put it in a fuel cell. So Alice Friedman, who's a quite brilliant energy critic, she said, look, if you don't understand this, send me $10 and I'll send you a dollar back. Okay. <laughs> and then comes the issue of water. It takes nine tons of water to produce one ton of hydrogen. So hydrogen is an energy sink. It, it's an energy carrier. It is not an energy source. And the fact that we're even having a conversation about it uh, is a testament to uh, our stupidity as a civilization. Um, last one, electric cars, and I won't say much about it. Um, but we all know the promise. I mean, electric cars are, I mean, they're, they're beautiful things. And they, you know, the, and, and they don't have as many moving parts, so they work quite well. Um, but really, do you think we can replace one billion cars on the planet with one billion electric cars? And will that solve any problems if we do so? And the answer is no. Transportation accounts for 16% of our greenhouse gases on the planet. 16%. So even if you electrified all of your vehicles, we've only dealt with a fraction of the problem. It takes fossil fuels to make electric cars, and, and, and particularly in the making of the batteries. Um, and then there's this whole issue of, you know, when, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, environmentalists actually talked about the social, political, and ecological impacts of the car and what they had done to cities and how the car had made cities uh, uh, more frantic, less livable, um, and, and, and uh, had changed the quality of life in dramatic ways, not to mention killing a nearly a million people every year. Um, but just this rapid, rapid transformation of our cities. Uh, and now we don't, we don't even talk about that. Now we accept the fact that the car has dramatically changed our, our, our cities, and that now, what we all, the only thing we really need to worry about are these batteries, right? All right, so what about these batteries, the, the really high cost item of an electric car? Well, first of all, let's talk about scale. Can you really scale them up and can you store a whole bunch? Well, Bill Rees, a great ecologist at UBC, put it this way, storing only 24 hours worth of US electricity generation in lithium batteries would cost 11.9 trillion take up 349 square miles and weigh 740 million, 74 million tons, right? Okay, we're not going to go there. That's not, 
An entire year of production from Tesla's Gigafactory in Utah could only store three minutes worth of annual US electricity demand. So again, the scale issue. Um, the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel, all of the rare minerals we need to construct batteries requires intensive mining. The quality of ores is declining. That means we make more and more mining waste. This is just a, it just shows you the, 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 the amount of uh, copper content in, in certain kinds of, of renewables. And this is an illustration. So the blue bars at the bottom shows you the amount of ore that's being recovered. The red bar shows you the amount of energy required to retrieve that ore as it declines in quality over time. There was a proposal in Alaska to build a, a pebble mine. It was called, uh, it was a Canadian proposal um, by a group in Vancouver. And they said, you know, to make our electric cars and to create the new world in the future, we need to put this mine in Alaska. And oh, and by the way, it, it, you know, it, it just, the world's last remaining sockeye runs just happened to be nearby. Um, and they were using green propaganda to try to justify their project. Then the last thing about electric cars, which I find very interesting, is that when you, the more and more you get into it, you realize that the, the end game here is not emissions. The end game is to put you in a self-driving automated car. It's a totally different agenda. Now, before I get into the heavy stuff here, <laughs> Let's practice this litany, this litany against fear. It's from Dune, it's by the writer Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert actually was the man that introduced me to the whole idea of ecology, which is really the study of consequences. So if you feel like it, repeat after me. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Remember that litany. <laughs> All right, so what are we avoiding here? What are the conversations we're avoiding before I, 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 I close? Well, the obvious one is population. There is no problem on Earth that doesn't become easier to manage with fewer people. We don't want to admit that. We don't want to talk about it. We are currently using up renewable resources of, of 1.7 Earths, and we're on our way to three by 2050. We're gonna run out of materials before we ever get to an energy transition. World population keeps on growing exponentially, but thanks to the convenience of of fossil fuels. I mean, we found this amazing resource and it has helped us as a species become the dominant species on the planet. It's not the only population you need to worry about. So we have the human population and then we have all of our energy slaves. Each and every one of us is being served by energy slaves in the forms of vehicles, mechanical uh, appliances, uh, digital appliances, and these slaves are numerous. They average somewhere between 200 and 8,000 slaves per person, particularly in North America. 
And this is all based on the calculation of one barrel of oil is equivalent to the labor of a human being for four and a half years. So what we have on the planet are 500 billion energy slaves. And that's why we have transformed it so quickly and in such an exponential way. So if we don't do something about human population um, and ignore this population, then we, we're not going anywhere. Um, we'll just skip that one. Um, no, I don't want to run out of time here. So the next thing that, that's really dogging us that we don't want to talk about is our energy blindness. So why do we know so little about energy? Why is it um, that we, we don't have uh, these tough conversations? And there's this thing called the Draken effect. And um, I found this really interesting. I, I came across this. It was uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb wrote about it in Anti-Fragility. And it, it's very simple. The more automated planes became, uh, the more uh, problems pilots encountered because they felt they didn't have to pay attention. And, uh, and they found the only way to fix that was to decrease the amount of automation so that the pilots could actually use the skills they were trained to use. Um, so they became fat and lazy, so to speak, uh, and were relying on these automatic systems. Our energy is so cheap and convenient, it has really blinded us to its true ecological, social, and political costs. You know, we flick on a switch. Uh, um, you know, we go to the gas station, fill up with gasoline. We, it, it's, we've stopped thinking about energy. Um, in particular, we've stopped thinking about energy and food and what is required. And this, this is Vaclav Schmil again. So here's a 125 gram tomato that represents 22 kilocalories of energy, right? And, and traditionally, a long time ago, it would take one unit of energy, and that being human muscle and maybe some cow shit and a few other things to, to grow that tomato. That's not how we grow tomatoes. No, we grow them industrially and the most efficiently way we can, and we require anywhere from 150 kilo, kilocalories to 875 kilocalories. So what is that equal to? 10 tablespoons of diesel fuel per tomato. Again, that is not sustainable. The cost of energy extraction is also no longer sustainable. And we would, again, we don't, it's not something we're aware of. Or, I mean, it, it, um, I subscribe to two newspapers. One is the Wall Street Journal, so I know what rich people are thinking, and then to the New York Times, so I know what liberal people in New York are thinking. And um, it was the Wall Street Journal that put me on to the crisis in fracking, that these guys weren't making any money. You know, they were causing earthquakes, they were destroying agricultural regions, um, but they weren't making any money. In fact, they were losing billions and billions of dollars because they cost so much, it cost so much, and they were using enormous amounts of energy, but all diminished returns in quality. And, and that's pretty much the story of fossil fuels at the moment. The other thing we're blind to is what have we used energy for? We have used energy to build more complexity. The more complexity we build, the more energy we need to maintain it. Joseph Tainer is an anthropologist in Utah, brilliant guy, now 70 years old. He says, energy has always been the basis of cultural complexity, and it always will be. And he also thinks because of that, the connection of energy to problem solving, we will not stop using fossil fuels until we are forced to. Even just think about responding to the atmospheric river that just devastated this province. Probably cost it, you know, billions and billions of dollars of damage to infrastructure. All of that infrastructure was built by fossil fuels the response to the crisis required fossil fuels. Helicopters to lift people out of mudslides. The last thing about energy, and this is one of these, this is uh, from my friend David Hughes, a brilliant um, geologist, probably the top energy 
uh, thinkers in Canada. And so on, on one part of the slide, you see where all the sources of emissions in Canada, and you can see the lines where the targets are, where we have to be in about 25 years. And then he points out that oil and gas production represents 26% of our emissions. And even if we were to reduce all of the emissions from all of the other sectors, we would still be 80% above our targets due to oil and gas exports. And the last thing I want to talk about is, is the technosphere, because this is, this is something um, that, is, that is immensely important and, again, is an issue we do not discuss. Um, and the media, which is part of the technosphere, of course, is not going to be a great critic of it. Uh, Nate Hagens, who used to be an investment banker, refers to it as a, you know, this super organism. Um, but really, it is an energy dissipating machine and it is totally unique in human history. And it is all based on the premise of endless, endless growth. So let me just catch up here with myself. Um, this is Las Vegas, 1984, NASA satellite image. Look at Lake Mead there. Now look at Lake Mead and look at Las Vegas. Right. That's what we do. That's what we do with energy. We are tr rapidly, rapidly transforming landscapes. <laughs> One of the most arid places in the world, right? Um, and, but the technosphere is all about growth. And that growth requires increasing levels of complexity that seeks to control every aspect of human life. The other thing about the technosphere is that it destroys natural systems and replaces them with artificial ones dependent on high energy technologies. You've got wild salmon running in rivers and the technosphere says, that's not right. That's not good. We're going to cut down all those trees. We're going to destroy those watersheds. And then we're going to put a fish farm in the bay. Uh, totally running on artificial energy inputs. And we will destroy a natural system that was sustaining people for thousands of years. And we will replace it with another system that has all of these horrific effects on, on life in the ocean. It's typical of our thinking, of our approach to everything. Um, you know, we, we take a wetland and we'll destroy it and replace it with a water, water, water filtration project. We'll take a forest and cut it down and we'll replace it with a reductionist, ridiculous uh, facsimile called a tree plantation. Um, so the technosphere has always emphasized growth and power. Everything is a means and only a means. The ends have disappeared. This concentration of power in the technosphere destroys all values and all meaning. The daily suppression of meaning is making us uneasy and anxious and unhappy. You can no more live spontaneously in a technological milieu than an astronaut can in space. Technology is to this civilization what the Catholic Church was to 14th century France the dominant institution that controlled every aspect of your life. Our new popes are people like Bezos, Musk, and Zuckerberg. The technosphere has one rule, to expand industry at any price and develop technological objects that can efficiently dominate natural and human affairs. And I could go, well, here, here's a good example of this is an illustration from one of Nate Hagen's presentations, where he just very simply identifies, here's the biosphere, here's the Earth, and, and now we have this incredible energy-gobbling organism made of countries and corporations um, that, is, that is mindless, but demands that it be fed, and demands that it continue growing at unsustainable rates. Um, this is a coal mine in Siberia, but guess what? 
it's going to be powered by windmills. <laughs> and that's the way the technosphere thinks. Right? And, and you've got a whole ideology going along with this. I mean, it, so you've got all of these Silicon Valley people who now are thinking about they really want to be immortals. They want to live forever, 700, 800 years, and technology is going to get us there and turn us into these uh, gods. Um, and we have increasingly a language devoid of meaning and spirit and character to go with it. And these are Lego words. These are plastic words. They are meant to be disposed. They come out of people's mouths and they mean fucking nothing. This is what's been going on at the COP conferences for 25 years. Blah, blah, blah. Watch for this language. The person who taught me most about this whole technological society is a most remarkable Frenchman by the name of Jacques Ellul. And he was an absolutely brilliant man and a prophet before his time. And he wrote a, the book about technological society and its impacts on human life and how it was transforming every aspect of human life called the Technological Society and it came out in the late 1950s. It, believe me, it is an incredibly dense book, but worth the read. And uh, you must also understand that Ulul was just not a critic of technology. He was a sociologist by trade. Um, he, um, uh, he was also a radical Christian. He would call him an anarch anarchist Christian. That's, he, he would be quite pleased. Um, and... Um, um, and to understand his critique of technology, you also have to read his theology. And he had uh, this rather remarkable observation. So this is the, the oven at a concentration camp, Bergen-Belsen. And the person in charge of this concentration camp was asked during the Nürburgring trials, um, didn't you find it horrible? Didn't you find all those corpses, thousands and thousands of corpses that the Allied troops found? Didn't you find that horrible? Didn't that bother you? Didn't that, that, and, and the technocrat replied, what could I do? The capacity of the ovens was too small. I couldn't process all those corpses. It caused me many problems. I had no time to think about those people. I was too busy with the technical problem of my ovens. And to Elul, that was the classic example of an irresponsible person who carries out his technical task um, to such a degree he's not interested in anything else. And that is the grave danger uh, that we face in almost every aspect of our lives. So Alul said this, no longer are we surrounded by fields, woods, and rivers, but by signs, signals, billboards, screens, labels, and trademarks that is our universe. We have forgotten where we came from. We have abandoned our ancestors. We'll skip that. A major fact of our present civilization is that more and more sin becomes collective and the individual is forced to participate in collective sin. All right? Every day you buy something and you ask, my God, okay, where did this plastic come from? Uh, where did this product come from? How was it made? And you know that it is part of a chain that is entirely unsustainable and that is not rooted in anything good. My last thing. This fellow, he kind of looks like a shrink, doesn't he? He is a shrink. He's a psychiatrist. His name is Ian McGilchrist. And um, he wrote a remarkable book in 2006 called The Master and the Emissary. And I only picked up this book because uh, I was reading something about John Cleese of Monty Python. And John Cleese said, you know, this is the most important book I've ever read in my life. 
And I thought, okay, if that's coming from John Cleese, I've, I've obviously missed something. I'm going to read this damn book. <laughs> right? Ordered the book, and the book is like, is like that. Right? I thought, oh my God. Um, but anyway, I am going to really simplify what Ian McGilchrist has to say, because what he has to say is incredibly important. All right, so we all know about the right brain and the left brain, but forget whatever preconception you have about how those two parts of the brain work. Um, Ian McGilchrist looked at it, and, and based on all kinds of research and his patients and everything else, he said, you know, these two parts of the brain are, the right brain is the master, the, the left brain is the emissary, and they, they work well together. They both complement each other in powerful ways. So you can't really think of them as two separate entities. But they're constantly working together. But their jobs are vastly different. So the right brain is concerned about the natural world. And it is expansive. It is uh, inquiring. It is always asking how. And the left brain is asking what and is reductive and, um, and, and, and is concerned about the artifacts that humans make. So the, the left brain would be good at writing code. The right brain would be the one that will tell you a story like the Iliad or the Odyssey. What McGillicurst says in his book is that what would happen if you lived in a society that favored the development of the left side of the brain, which we are now in. And he talks about different civilizations and the Renaissance um, was an expression, both sides of the brain actually in equal balance, both science and art and um, the industrial revolution, obviously left side brain. So technological society right now, definitely left brain. What would that society look like? What would, what would be some of the characteristics of that society? Skill and judgment replaced by repeatable processes, a loss of the broader picture, fear and paranoia, anger and aggressiveness, language devoid of richness and meaning. Even Illich. Another great um, thinker really cuts to the chase. A low energy policy allows for a wide choice of lifestyles and cultures. If on the other hand, a society opts for high energy spending, its social relations must be dictated by technocracy and will be equally degrading whether labeled capitalist or socialist. My last point. All right, so we have an aging civilization. Civilizations have an average lifespan of 350 years. Um, these are the five horsemen of the apocalypse as identified by archaeologist Ian Morris. Mass migration, epidemic pandemic disease, state failure, famine, climate change. We are in the throes of it. Many of the same things happen when a marriage fails. You have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You have criticism, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling. If that doesn't define the nature of our discourse at the moment, I don't know what does. And in a marriage, I think most people get locked into left brain thinking. And they can't find a way out. Peter Turchin, brilliant Russian historian. I really like this guy a lot. He started off studying bark beetles. And he moved on to human history. This is a guy who understands human complexity. Um, like many historians these days, he recognizes that life goes in cycles. You know, if you talk to any traditional, but Carla will tell you, life is a cycle. It is not a linear path. It is not an exponential thing. It is a cycle. It is life and death. Um, it is birth and renewal. Um, and Civilizations experienced the same things. And we have peaked, and we are now entering a transition phase of incredible volatility. Turchin described the symptoms loss of asabaya, overproduction of elites, immiseration of the people, poverty, high levels of political violence, massive wealth inequalities, 
declining fiscal health of the state. The other thing about failing civilizations is that the left brain becomes dominant. Now, why do I tell you all these things? Why, why are we, you know, really, for one particular reason. I think everyone, every citizen needs to know what the consequences of bad policy and bad government mean. And I call it the Titanic factor. This, again, is something that Nate Hagens has written about. How many people in the, were from first class that died in the Titanic? 39%. How many from second class who died? 58%. How many in steerage died? 76%. So the consequences of bad policy making and decision always falls upon the poor and ordinary people. And I tell you all these things for this reason. When we become conscious of what determines our life, we attain the highest degree of freedom. And I want to close with just a few points. What can you do in a world that's unraveling? Well, Paul Kings North, a former environmentalist, and now a farmer in Ireland, has a couple of pointers, and I've kind of elaborated on them. The first is withdraw from the fray of the technosphere by refusing to be part of the machine to tighten the ratchet that is a moral position, writes Kingsworth North. All real change starts with withdrawal and reflection. The American poet Robson Jeffers would add, keep your own integrity, be merciful and uncorrupted, and not wish for evil, and not be duped by dreams of universal justice or happiness. These dreams will not be fulfilled. Preserve the natural world. Find a creek, find a river, Find a mountain, buy your home, defend its creatures, be rooted in everything you do, find your place, uh, which is hard in a technosphere because we are all unearthed, desterrados, as they say in Spanish. Simone Weil noted long ago, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. Three, get your hands dirty in a garden, on a farm, in the forest, in the ocean. Spend more time in the real world doing real work. Abandon your gadgets. Live life with fewer conveniences, and you will understand the meaning of freedom. You may even discover how much freedom you have lost. Four. Insist that creation has a value beyond utility. That great conversation between us and nature used to inform and shape our daily lives. Restore that conversation. Or as Wendell Berry has put it, think less. Build refuges and prepare for the unstolding, unfolding storms ahead. Ask yourself, what power do I have to preserve what matters in my community? After reading the great poem, The Iliad, Simone Weil described what she had learned. Nothing is sheltered from fate. Never admire might or hate the enemy or despise sufferers. Wake each morning and ask like the Ashanavi, what you can give to this world rather than what you can take. Um, and again, I'll leave the last word to Simone Weil. God did not create anything except love itself and the means to love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, we have actually, 
very little time for questions. Well, sorry. <laughs> sorry about and that. we no. have um, 1,100 people on uh, the webinar, so we're not going to get to everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to invite, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we'll have time for, for a couple of questions. And if they could just be questions and not statements um, because of the very limited time we have until uh, this auditorium needs to be vacated, which is, you know, five to seven minutes. So um, can I have uh, any questions from our audience today? <coughs> Can you say something about paradigm shift? Yep. Can I say something about paradigm shift? <laughs> we're not shifting. Yeah. I mean, we're shifting problems, but we're not shifting. We haven't, we haven't got the message yet. So we, we will need more crises to, to get us going. No? How, how can we pry those implement out of our own hands. I, I wonder because I sit around and we're all I know. How do we stop? It's an addiction. It is an Carla, it is an addiction. It is um, that's why they have made them, right? It is kind of the Yeah, okay, I haven't good, got a good answer on how, we, how are we to stop, but I, we need to have more conversations about the psychic, psychically damaging impact they are having on our, on our hearts and minds. And um, uh, probably the worst thing that happened during the pandemic was that so many people and so many children were forced to spend so much time with these colonizing machines. And that's what they are. They, they are colonizing us. And we, we don't have the courage to, to say, wait a moment, we are being colonized. Uh, I'll just ask a question from the a virtual audience. Um, what are some examples of public policies um, that would uh, address the problems you've discussed? Or maybe you have an example of one that you think has addressed some of these problems. Well, first of all, you have to get uh, a political conversation going about contracting the economy. And that's going to be extremely difficult because no politician, every politician, they, all they, they talk about is, is growth and technology. And that we're, we're going to grow our way out of this pandemic and recover. And we're going to recover better with renewable technologies. And, and, and nobody wants to admit, no, it, we've blown our budget here. We are destroying the last vestiges of life on this planet. And we must beat a sustainable retreat. Um, and, and until we can get that conversation going, there'll be no policy in that direction whatsoever. Um, and, um, but it is a conversation every community can have. And, and communities can just go ahead and say, you know what, we're, we're going this direction. We're gonna power down and we're gonna figure out how to do it. Um, you don't have to wait for your government to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that it's even considered a radical or a radical idea that the only way we can really get out of this mess without um, sacrificing millions upon millions of people is, uh, is to power down. And if you live in a smaller community, is that to some extent an advantage as opposed to the top down from a... Yeah. Yeah, it is, because you're, you're already living a different kind of life. You're more engaged with your neighbors. Um, you're probably more engaged with the natural world. You're not, um, you're not caught in, a, in, 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 in the spider web of a city. And uh, uh, you have a little more flexibility and freedom to begin different things. You can grow your own food, for starters. Um, and you can secure your own supply chains within your community to make sure that everyone has access to stuff that is locally grown. Um, 
So there is more flexibility and freedom in, 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 in rural communities and in smaller communities. And that's where the real change is all gonna take place and is already beginning to take place. Um, because most ordinary people know that trouble is brewing and they, you have to, you know, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. So. Um, I have grandkids that I hope are alive in 2100. And I'm with you on everything you've said except one, one thing that I have a question. Sure. To expound upon a little bit. You have a little bit, but a bit more. You talk about the footprint of our clothes and our yeah. EVs and our batteries and turbines and solar panels. Yeah. Um, can they not buy us the time we need to recover to an extent? Um, and isn't, isn't the goal to end combustion and not end fossil fuels? Well, okay. Um, I, we are headed towards some kind of hybrid economy, that's for sure, where, where there will be a fossil fuel budget because not everything can be electrified, um, or, nor should everything be electrified. We have to be very strategic about, um, about this. And we also have to be very, we have to find ways of actually, okay, so if we do this, will we actually use fewer fossil fuels, I mean, and, and therefore create fewer emissions. Or if we do this, will we just be consuming more energy in a different way? Um, and uh, so far we, we're, we're, you know, we see renewables um, being developed, but we don't see any change in emissions because that energy is being, um, we're consuming that energy for other things. We're not using it to retire uh, fossil fuel spending. Um, so we need to change our thinking on that. And, and again, I, I think that's something that local communities would be much better. You know, if you went to PEI and said, okay, guys, you know, uh, you're a small island, you know, and, and um, pretty homogeneous, figure it out, guys. You pick the best way of, number one, reducing your, your energy spending by 40%. Um, and I, I think you really need to focus on energy, not just on emissions, because we don't want to focus on emissions. And the way we've come up with the, the whole emissions equation is this crazy thing called net zero emissions. Well, what the hell does that mean, net zero emissions? It means that there's a guy over here who's making 100 tons of CO2 a day, and that he can do that as long as another guy over here says, well, I've got a technology that will take that 100 tons out of the air maybe 25 years from now. So you, you've got a license to, to emit. And because, you're, you know, and, and, but we're, we're really not catching up with the emissions ever. Um, so we, we really need to focus on, on the energy spending. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy task. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <laughs> um, uh, uh, just to say that this talk will be available where we've uh, recorded the webinar and along with the slide presentation and many people online have asked that it be also presented. It will be um, posted on the TAI early next week if you want to send it to your friends or review some of the slides uh, as well. And uh, um, we do have to empty uh, the auditorium in the next, you know, five, five or ten minutes for a class. So um, please join me in thanking Andrew for this wonderful uh, discussion today.